Angela Perry, thanks so much for coming on to Evolution Soup from your home in Newcastle, right here in the UK. You are an archaeologist at Durham University, and your research focuses on early relationships between humans, animals, and climate. You've recently led genetic research on dire wolves, the extinct species of North American carnivores, and will be publishing a paper on your findings very soon. Angela, we've just shown a clip from Game of Thrones, which of course features direwolves. A lot of people think that they were just a made-up creature, but they are, or rather were, <laughs> definitely real. Uh, but I can only assume that interest in this creature has skyrocketed since the debut of that show. Would you say so? Uh, yeah, I, I would definitely say so. I think that um, a lot of people weren't necessarily uh, familiar with direwolves, uh, weren't quite sure that they were a real animal versus a kind of mythological creature that was created um, for the show. Um, we kind of think of direwolves as this iconic um, Pleistocene extinct Ice Age animal. Um, but the Game of Thrones and this kind of relationship with uh, having these domesticated dire wolves um, through that show has really um, made interest in these animals and kind of their history and interactions potentially with humans um, be kind of this focus point um, I've seen kind of in the last few years uh, with the popularity of the show. So for me as a canid researcher and someone who does work on dire wolves and dogs and things like that, it's really exciting. Well, before we get into all the fascinating information gleaned from your genetic studies of this animal, let's just hear a little bit about your background. Sure. So I am a zooarchaeologist. So that is an archaeologist who specifically studies the remains of fauna found at archaeological sites and interactions between humans and those animals and the local environments and climates and things like that. So I'm really interested in all types of animals, but my specialty uh, really is carnivores and specifically canids, like wolves and dogs mm. and things like that. Um, so I started as an anthropology undergrad at Portland State University. University in Portland, Oregon, um, and I got my PhD at Durham University here in the UK, and I was a postdoc at the uh, Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Germany um, before coming back here to Durham um, to be a Marie Curie postdoc um, to do additional work on canids and interactions with humans. Uh, so I've kind of been all over in Europe for about the last 10 years, um, but my real interest and passion is uh, looking at interactions between humans and animals um, in the Americas. And you said you worked at Max Planck. So did you meet Svante Pabo, the guy who uh, sequenced <laughs> the Neanderthal? I know? did. I did. Um, the genetics department was just one floor up from us. So the geneticists were um, right on top of us. So one great thing about the Max Planck Institute is um, the potential to have five departments that are all kind of interrelated and having colleagues that you work with and see kind of every day and having really easy, great conversations about, um, you know, if you have a question about something genetics, you just walk upstairs and ask, you know, the people who are the experts in the field um, about things like Neanderthals and early humans and things like that. So it was really exciting for our department, which was human evolution, um, to get to interact a lot with um, the geneticists upstairs in Savante's group. Angela, what can you tell us about the direwolf's ancestry and how it came to be in the Americas? It's interesting. So this has always um, been a question. Direwolves have, again, been this kind of iconic creature of the last ice age, um, hmm. of all the animals that kind of went extinct at the end of um, late Pleistocene. Direwolves kind of stick 
along with maybe mammoths as these kind of iconic creatures. Um, yet we really know very little about dire wolves. Um, most of the dire wolves we do know about um, come from the La Brea Tar Pit site in LA. We have over 4,000 individuals there. Um, but unfortunately, the tar of the tar pits kind of any um, hinders the DNA preservation of those creatures. So up until our recent study, we've been unable to sequence the DNA of dire wolves. Um, what we know about dire wolves comes primarily from studies of the morphology for you know, the last hundred years. Um, and we have always believed because of the very similar morphological features between dire wolves and our gray wolves um, that there was a very close relationship um, between the two animals that they were potentially sister lineages um, and that they were just very closely related to each other their morphology um, their cranial morphology their teeth um, they look very similar to each other so for a long time that this has really been our assumption um, until our recent study now um, will kind of turn that on its head a bit which is exciting hmm. so what about the dire wolves appearance uh, if we were to see one today standing next to a, a modern gray wolf for instance what differences would we see it's always hard to say what an extinct creature uh, would look like if we saw it in the flesh um, hmm. We assume kind of most standard recreations of a dire wolf looks a lot like what we would think of as a modern kind of Arctic timber wolf, but a bit larger um, and a bit more robust. So we know from the skeleton of um, the dire wolves that we do have that they were on average a, a bit bigger than the average gray wolf. Um, they were maybe about 150 pounds. We do know that their kind of skeletal morphology um, is definitely a bit more robust, um, mm. kind of broader, thicker limbs than the average gray wolf. Um, but they do seem to be uh, roughly about the same size as some of our biggest kind of Arctic timber wolves. So we tend to think of a dire wolf as this kind of giant megafauna big huge wolf um but probably not that much bigger than some of our um, biggest wolves now they do have um more uh, uh robust kind of dental morphology so a bit bigger teeth um more designed for bringing down the kind of larger megafauna like mammoth mm. mastodon horses things like that that they were living with um in the pleistocene of the americas um so in that sense they did tend to be kind of a bigger more robust version of a gray wolf um it is possible um, from our new work that the dire wolves um, potentially um, gave rise in the, in South America. So it is possible, although we have this vision of gray wolf or mm. dire wolves as this kind of very furry um, timber wolf looking animal, that it may look a bit more like a warm adapted canid. So potentially something like a hyena or a jackal um, that has a bit shorter coat, um, kind of a smaller ears, things like that. Um, something more like an African Canaan. Um, so that's something that we're hoping to do more work on in the future is kind of figure out what is the look of a dire wolf. Okay, the dire wolf was found in the Americas of the Pleistocene from 250,000 years ago. What would the environment have been like at that time and what animals were its main competitors? So we know that we have dire wolf material from about 250,000 years ago. There are some potentially earlier material than that. And um, our new paper coming out, we have some of the latest dates for dire wolves at around 13, 12, 13,000 years ago. So that's a long time span. Um, and that time span in the Americas often referred to as the Rancho La Brean, um, named after the La Brea tar pits um, in California, is kind of a period of um, warm and cold cycles. So through time, you would have um, kind of a colder adaptation and then warmer adaptations. And you would see likely um, what we know from the tar pits, some variation in dire wolf um, body size, morphology, um, relating to those kind of warm, cold cycles. Um, what we do know about where we find dire wolves during that period is they tend to be kind of lowland adapted. You don't tend to find them in kind of um, 
high elevation sites, Arctic sites, things like that. They tend to be um, fairly adapted to kind of lowland, um, warmer adapted regions and areas in the kind of lower latitudes of North America and some examples in South America. So unlike kind of these Arctic timber wolves that we think of in gray wolves, um, they don't tend to like or be well adapted um, to the kind of colder northern latitudes um, right. in the Americas. We have very few examples of them um, from up there. As far as the competition, this is something that's really interesting and that, again, we don't know a lot about. Um, we know during that time period that we have other carnivores like saber-toothed cats, um, giant short-faced bears, American lions, um, these kind of nice swath of extinct um, mega carnivores during that time mm. period. Um, many of these found also with places like the La Brea Tar Pits um, that we would assume that dire wolves were likely in competition with. Um, but like the dire wolves, this kind of group of mega carnivores also went extinct um, at the end of the Pleistocene. Dozens of direwolf skulls were found in the La Brea Tar Pit site and are now on display in the museum there, a whole wall of them, in fact. Do we know why so many of them were getting trapped in the, in the tar pit so long ago? I highly recommend going and visiting the La Brea Museum and seeing that amazing wall um, of dire wolves. One thing you will notice from that wall of dire wolves is that there is some interesting variation in kind of the size and morphology mm. of, of those dire wolf skulls. Um, the La Brea Tar Pits are a really interesting, exciting site. We have so many animals um, preserved in those tar pits over time um, that have given us a lot of insight into animals in the late Pleistocene, um, including dire wolves. Um, so we think that a lot of the carnivores that are at La Brea um, are there and were caught in the tar seeps as a result of probably trying to scavenge off of the mega herbivores that were stuck in the tar pits. So, you know, a family of mammoths or horses or American camels, things like that, would have wandered into the tar seeps and been stuck in these tar seeps. And of course, the idea of these kind of struggling mega herbivores is going to draw um, all types of predators towards them. Um, and then also those predators end up getting stuck in the tar seeps as well. And so you kind of have this cycle of herbivores and carnivores um, getting stuck in these tar seeps. Um, bad for the animals, but great for us as researchers who mm. get to um, look at these perfectly preserved examples of um, dire wolves and other carnivores and herbivores uh, over time. Of course, it discolors the bones quite a bit, though. It's it does the, discolor the problem. bones. <laughs> it discolors <laughs> the bones. It causes problems for us um, who are interested in ancient DNA because tar isn't exactly um, the greatest um, <laughs> thing to help preserve ancient DNA. Um, stable isotope analysis has worked on some of, um, some of the material from there, but we're still working on the possibility. We've looked at... Um, trying to preserve DNA or extract DNA from some of the material from um, La Brea and it just hasn't, it just hasn't worked. Fighting against the tar has been a little bit too difficult, but really great for looking at the morphology um, of the animals. Wow. Well, if the dire wolf is a pack animal like modern wolves, it could probably go after some of the massive megafauna of the time, such as mammoths. Is that right? Yeah, another thing, again, that we don't really know um, about dire wolves, some of the very first stable isotope analyses um, looking at their diet is, is starting to come out now. We don't fully understand um, the diet of, of dire wolves. Um, we believe that they were pack animals, like gray wolves were, um, and we, we assume that they were hunters of um, megafauna like mammoths, mastodons, um, some of the extinct herbivores that people may not think about or even know were in the Americas. Um, 
like American camel and giant ground sloths and things like that. Um, so it's likely that they were going after um, a number of these extinct horses in the Americas, things like that, um, that those were their main prey and they were working um, as a pack to take down um, these mega, mega herbivores. Um, and that the extinction of these mega herbivore um, prey species is also what um, contributed to the demise of the dire wolf. Well, we're talking about the Pleistocene era, so there could have been some human dire wolf interaction at that time. And if so, could some of them have been domesticated? I love the idea of domesticated dire wolves, and probably anyone who's a fan <laughs> of Game of Thrones is excited about the idea of domesticated dire wolves. Um, what we know from our recent research is that um, the dates that we have, um, we had some, we have some um, kind of later dates on old, um, old remains um, dating from the 80s and 90s, which is a little bit questionable because we have kind of new dating techniques, um, which were more reliable as far as radiocarbon dating. Um, the date that we have uh, in our new paper, we believe is probably the most reliable uh, latest date, and that dates to around 12,900 years ago. So that would be mm -hmm. about the latest date. Um, directly dated material that we have um, for dire wolves. And that we know in that time period that we definitely had humans in the Americas, that people were probably coming into the Americas um, at least by 16,000 years ago. So we definitely have an overlap in the time periods of the peopling of the Americas and um, dire wolves living uh, still in the Americas. Um, so we can assume that at some point some humans likely saw came across um, dire wolves and they may have had some interaction unclear still what that would have looked like and how that would have happened where things like that um, some of the other uh, sites that i work on um, in particular there are a handful of sites in the southwest in arizona new mexico region um, where we do have evidence of dire wolves at hmm anthropogenic sites. So we have human archaeological material um, at the same time period where we have dire wolf material. Um, there are only a handful of sites where we have both evidence for humans and dire wolves in the same location. Um, and my research now is kind of ongoing looking at, is this interaction real? Did the humans at that site have um, a potential kind of hunting interaction were they killing dire wolves what what did that interaction look like um the material from those sites is really interesting uh because it tends to be much much smaller than the average mm. dire wolf um that that we know about so what does that mean um it can mean a number of things it could mean that in the southwest you have essentially an ecomorph which is a kind of local variation of dire wolves that were just smaller um, than others. We know that we have at least two subspecies of dire wolves. We have a kind of Western um, species of dire wolf that tends to be um, slightly smaller than the more Eastern version of dire wolves. So it's possible that there's this kind of Southwestern version of a dire wolf that just tends to be smaller. Um, this is, these are Clovis period sites, so these are much later even than the 12, 13,000 year old um, mm. dire wolf that we identified. Um, so it's a potential that these dire wolves at these sites are kind of the last gasps of the dire wolf population um, and that they are surviving from scavenging off of human remains and human kills, um, that they're using the Southwest as a bit of a refuge and they're kind of in their last unfortunate gasps of their population surviving. Um, the kind of extreme idea would be that there, is there a potential that these dire wolves are having some kind of commensal relationship with humans in this region? Um, are humans allowing them to scavenge their kills? Are humans getting closer to them? Do humans have some sort of, um, yeah, domestic relationship with these animals um, that's probably the extreme possibility but again um, humans did it with wolves and so could be possible that they that they did it with dire wolves um, that's something that we would like to look at in the future 
Right. So we, you were mentioning the Clovis people that were uh, there at the time. Uh, so these would be ancient Homo sapiens, wouldn't they? Yes, they would be an ancient population um, that is related to the Native Americans that peopled the Americas. Right. Let's focus now on your genetic research because this is really exciting. Your forthcoming paper is on the ancient DNA extracted from direwolf specimens. So what does the DNA revealed about the direwolf itself? Uh, how closely related was it to the wolves of today? Right. So as I said before, our um, kind of long term ideas about where the direwolves fell in this kind of American canid family um, was always that it was likely closely related to the extant or not still living um, American mm -hmm. canids, such as gray wolves and coyotes, um, and then eventually domesticated dogs. And so the morphology between gray wolves and dire wolves is so similar um, that that morphological taxonomic work has just suggested that they're just likely this very closely related group, likely a sister clade um, to our gray wolves. And that's kind of the, the working model that we've been going with for a very long time when we think about dire wolf evolution, um, because we hadn't been able to get ancient DNA out of any samples um, up until now. Um, and so our recent work, um, part of what it showed, uh, we expected that we would find dire wolves did have a very close relationship um, to gray wolves. What we actually found is that gray wolves and the other extant canids like um, coyotes and domesticated dogs um, shared a most recent common ancestor 5.5 million years ago. Um, so that's a really extreme amount of time. We thought that they would be closely related, but to but showing that dire wolves, the clay, the lineage of dire wolves, essentially broke off from the, the rest of this wolf coyote family over hmm. five million years ago, and essentially has no close relationship um, to living gray wolves or coyotes or dogs um, at all. In fact, we found that um, the lineage of the African jackals is even more closely related to gray wolves and coyotes than dire yeah. wolves are. Um, so what this has shown us, the, the kind of evidence that we put together with this is that there were essentially kind of these three wolf-like canid clades. Um, one of those clades includes the gray wolves, um, uh, African wolves, the golden wolf, um, coyotes, Kuan, things like that. And then we have this kind of jackal clade with the two African jackals. Um, and then we have dire wolves, which are essentially the last of an extinct, now extinct lineage um, that is in no way related um, to gray wolves um, in, in any kind of recent time. Uh, so it was a really exciting result for us. Um, it also suggests to us that um, dire wolves actually have no business being in the genus Canis, which they they are now. Their genus is Canis, and they're referred to as Canis diarus. Um, so we suggest that they return to uh, a genus that they were put in in about 1913 called Anosion, uh, which in Latin means a uh, terrible or dreadful wolf. Mm -hmm. um, so we suggest they go to Inosion diarus, um, which makes a lot more sense for them um, being in this kind of extinct clade. So if the dire wolf wasn't related to gray wolves or coyotes, as you said, is there any evidence of interbreeding between those species? So it's interesting that you ask that because this is another question um, that we had was, um, potential interaction, interbreeding um, between either dire wolves and gray wolves or even the ancestors of dire wolves and gray wolves. Um, so we looked at dire wolf potential for interbreeding um, across all of the other kind of wolf-like canids, uh, and we found no evidence for interbreeding um, between coyotes, gray wolves, dogs, anything like that. Um, and because canids have a tendency to like to interbreed with each other, we know we have koi wolves and half wolf, half dog, half half dog, half wolf, half coyote, half dog. We have they love to interbreed with each other. And if we had dire wolves 
and coyotes or gray wolves or dogs um, in the same kind of environment for a long period of time, we would ha we would hmm. expect to find some interbreeding between them. So the fact that we didn't find any interbreeding um, in the genomes of any of these animals suggests to us that um, dire wolves were likely alone in the Americas for a very long period of time, um, essentially leaving them kind of evolutionarily isolated um, to the point where when they did eventually encounter coyotes and gray wolves, they were unable to successfully breed with them and produce offspring. Um, so what's really interesting about this is that it suggests that any of the more recent um, canid fossils in the Americas um, like Canis edwardii, for example. Um, Canis edwardii is often considered um, the likely ancestor of coyotes. Um, but we find Canis edwardii uh, at the same time period as dire wolves. And since we find no evidence of dire wolves interbreeding with coyotes, that means dire wolves also also didn't interbreed with the immediate ancestor of coyotes either. And so what that means for any of these kind of fossils in the Americas during that time period is that they are all likely on the dire wolf lineage and not the coyote or the gray wolf lineage as previously mm -hmm. believed. Um, so it suggests that Dire wolves are alone in North or South America, both for a very long period of time, while the ancestors of gray wolves and coyotes and other kind of um, large wolf-like American canids were likely in Eurasia, um, evolving and not entering the Americas until after a certain time period had um, lapsed to where um, dire wolves became essentially genetically hmm. isolated and could not interbreed um, with them. So this is a really interesting finding as well. The idea that dire wolves and their ancestors are just wandering the Americas alone as the only kind of canid. Um, we have some really interesting um, large canids in South America, um, Canis gezi and Canis naringi. Um, which are about dire wolf size, and there's been a long debate about whether they are ancestors of dire wolves or are dire wolves themselves. Some version of mm. dire wolves are closely related to dire wolves. Um, so, kind of the next step with that would be to look at these interesting South American large canids to see how closely related they are to dire wolves or are they dire wolves themselves. Um, to look at this picture of potential just kind of isolation of the dire wolf lineage um, alone in the Americas. One thing we do know though is that the dire wolves seem to be the kind of last sad um, uh, yeah. example of their lineage in the Americas and once they go extinct that's kind of the end of, of that of that canid lineage and we don't we don't see them um, living on in you know coyotes or wolves or dogs or anything else so I suppose if anyone does come up to you and say uh, dire wolves are they still alive or I'm sure they're still alive um, you could say well maybe in South America well, it's, if they're still alive anywhere, South America would likely uh, be the place. We don't have many examples of dire wolves in South America. Um, we have a couple spots here and there. I know there's a concerted effort to um, breed a dire wolf-like dog, um, the American dire wolf that people um, would love to have, um, a dog or a wolf or something that has this kind of dire wolf DNA in it. Um, I think it's unlikely that we'll find any example um, of living dire wolves, but if it's anywhere, it's probably somewhere in Central or South America. So it would be really exciting if we did find it for the first time in 10,000 years. Well, I suppose a good question to end on is, why did they go extinct? Why did they go extinct? This is one of the questions we address in some of our um, new research. It's a good question and it looks like the most likely answer is that they go extinct around the same time as giant short-faced bear, American lion, other mega carnivores at that period who are relying mm. on the megafauna. Um, of that time. So we have mammoth and mastodon and horse and all of these other American um, herbivores that are going extinct at that time period. And we know that um, dire wolves are specialized in hunting these large fauna. Um, so it's likely a case of 
direwolves not being as dietarily and morphologically adaptable and flexible um, the way that gray wolves are. Mm. And so it looks like once their mega prey goes extinct, that dire wolves can't survive. Um, whereas it's an interesting dichotomy with gray wolves, who were also around during that time period at the end of the Pleistocene. But it seems that gray wolves have the ability to adapt um, and respond to this extinction of these megafauna and to learn to hunt different animals and in different environments. Um, but that dire wolves just couldn't um, adapt to this kind of changing environment and climate and, and the downfall of their herbivore prey. So they just go the way of their prey and um, eventually go extinct with the other mega carnivores. Yeah, so sad, really. It's a sad story. Okay, that was an excellent dive into the world of the dire wolf. And a big thank you to our mutual friend, David Ian Howe of Ethnosynology, who told me about your fantastic research. I will leave links to your work in the description below. And all that's left to say is thank you once again, Angela, for coming on to Evolution Soup. Thank you for having me. Um, hopefully everyone gets to see our work when it comes out and keep an eye out for more dire wolf research.